Probably everybody on here knows who Joe Arabaran is. If you're uh, you're in the Southeast U.S. where he resides, or anywhere else throughout the country where he works with dealerships and making sure that they uh, can operate and, and get all the leads they need through the BDC process. Um, Joe, awesome! Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Brian, for for that intro. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, cool. So um, let me know, I'm gonna go through, cause it's just not a real webinar until there are technical difficulties. That's just, uh, you know, the nature of the beast. So we'll work through it, but you guys let me know if you can hear me fine or if at any point you stop hearing me. I also wanted to say for, obviously those of you be joining on the chat, feel free to put any comments. I wanna try to make it as, you know, dynamic as possible. And for my fellow panelists and round, you know, uh, round table uh, host, uh, feel free to jump in with like any comments and stuff like that. So I'll try my best to keep up with the, my ADHD, but it's all good. Um, I want to make it dynamic for people. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen because I too, like Joe, uh, my twin over there, have a presentation that I want to share with you guys. So let me know as soon as that comes up and give me like a thumbs up if you guys see my screen. Awesome. Okay, cool, cool deal. So let's go ahead and get rocking right away. Let, for those of you that are here, um, let's just go through a few like housekeeping items. I don't know if we went through them earlier on, but try to silence your cell phone, close like Facebook tab or any other possible you know distractions. And feel free, like I mentioned, to ask questions over the chat. If you run, own, um, or at the leadership level of like of either power sports, uh, marine and RV dealer, the next 45 minutes or so, I really believe could be a game changer with regards to the technical aspect and also the theoretical uh, about BDC and follow up. So that brings me to my next question, which is a very common one, which what is BDC? And essentially, it stands for Business Development Center. And it's really a fancy way to say follow-up, right? It focuses on the development of sales and service for the side of your dealership. And the main goal is to improve engagement for leads that are coming in and doing so through multiple avenues, as many as possible. And I'll get into some of those details through the presentation uh, so that you could really engage, you know, whatever money you're spending on marketing, you can make it go further by engaging the people that are essentially your incoming leads. And I feel it's a big start to the relationship process. And I may pick your, bro, uh, your brain, uh, Joe, uh, on some of the stuff because I feel like so much of what you talked about, it's like, that's what precedes the stuff I'm gonna talk about. So um, I would love to, you know, for you to jump in when you have, uh, uh, you know, some input as far as like, maybe a little anecdote or something on things you've heard over calls, because I'm going to have some stories to tell as, as we go into it. So the main goal of BDC essentially is going to be, you know, increasing conversion rates, appointments, and your close sales, right? So what I want to show you guys today is essentially how to effortlessly and quickly be able to follow, follow up with qualified leads and maximizing your ROI, your return on investment, for the money that you guys are spending for your dealerships on trying to get new customers through the door. Uh, I'm gonna talk about syncing that process uh, of, of sales and follow up with marketing because it's all part of a flywheel. And if you think about gears, if you have the wrong gear uh, ratios on, you're just essentially gonna be grinding them all the time and you're gonna feel like you're stuck in a rut and you're not actually moving anywhere. And that's actually a perfect analogy to how a lot of dealerships feel. So this 
Ghost speaks to the, te the, the, the theoretical aspects and the technical aspects of re relieving some of those problems so that, you know, you can really, it can break loose and it could be a lot more effective. So we're going to talk also about using lead follow-up and automation technology to really get you to what's most important, right? Selling more fun and having happy customers. So why listen to me at all? Uh, you, you know, you guys have, your time is extremely valuable and you're here joining us today, spending time to learn, but um, you want to know that you're, you're learning from reputable sources and from reputable people. So this stuff, you know, it's kind of boring. I won't spend too, too much on it, but you know, I've got personal experience in over 15 years in digital marketing. My career actually started back in a uh, car dealership, which Shortly thereafter, as the marketing director in a power sports dealership, I identified the enormous disparity between the resources that power sports, marine, and RV dealerships get. Um, and I was also in your shoes in having, you know, the burden of marketing uh, for a dealership and then questioning, are these good leads? How do we integrate everything? So many of the, of the questions that come into mind when you're having to essentially be at the helm of that, right? Um, you'll see that I have uh, collaborations with a lot of really cool industry people, one of them um, being here with us as an attendee, another one actually being with us as a panelist. Um, and so I've been very blessed and very lucky in that sense. And, and yeah, so essentially we've gotten to work with dozens of top of the power, of power sports dealers. And I'll show you guys an example of a few of them. Let me know if you guys can still see my screen okay, if you can hear me okay. This is, this is our family, right? Uh, this, and, and I just uh, compacted it to just one slide uh, because for time's purposes, but this is an example of some of the dealers that we help and we really consider them as family. The goal is to essentially work with them to get their marketing and their follow-up in sync using the right tools to not only just get sales like that's a very simplistic sort of I mean simplistic it's it's complicated but it's just when you're talking about your goal and you just say okay I want to increase sales that's very singular um, the goal is also you know to grow leadership uh, uh, and and the culture in general at the dealer by having the right things in place right and be being able to and piggybacking off of my my twin Joe um, you know going to like Simon Sinek's why um, I love that the original TED talk that kind of launched them on that. Um, and what we have found out, and I'm going to show you guys with regards to the process of BDC and follow-up is details aside, by the way, not having a clear why you're in business, why you're doing certain things that they lead you to have these things that where you seemingly essentially feel stuck, right? That is like out of all the dealers that we've helped, we hear this very often. We hear that there's, and they may not necessarily use the words, I feel stuck, um, but there are certain pain points that they go through, which we hear constantly. And this one's one of them. It's at the, at the core of it. We hear some other things like, well, you know, I've used marketing companies and I feel they're unreliable. Then I hire somebody in house and, you know, they are not able to handle as much as I thought, uh, you know, well, this, the, the off season, Sales are slowing down. It's how it's hard to follow up with leads. Um, and the, another common one is, you know, I'm getting tons of leads from online, but they're not good quality. And I'm going to go into addressing for every single one of these why what most people perceive to be the actual problem is not. And it actually boils right back down to being able to get that right ratio on that gear and making the flywheel just function the way that it's supposed to, just nice and even, right? Um, in the cases of what we've seen of all the dealers we work with, we see that there's a good chunk, it's kind of like that economist 80-20 rule, right? Um, similar scenario where like 80, 90% of the revenue is being taken by the top performing, you know, 20 or 10% of dealers. Now, let me show you guys a case study um, that's super important here with regards to an example of how we've helped some of our clients. And it's impressive. You can, we can all agree by looking at it like, wow, yeah, the marketing's working. 
And then I ask the question, but does it matter, right? And that's where uh, there's an important differentiation to know that whoever you uh, are go moving forward to be your uh, marketing partner, whoever is going to either handle your marketing, whether it is in-house or a third party or whatever the case may be. This morning, but overall it's going well. Whoops. I'm sorry. That's okay. I think we're good now. Okay. Joe, um, there's your technical difficulty. It's out of the way. <laughs> you're sailing. You're ready to rock. No issues. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, cool. Cool deal. So essentially long story short is I asked the question, did the marketing, the, so the marketing worked. The question is, did it matter? And why do I ask that question? It's not to be negative. It's because that's what's going to lead us down the path of being able to truly, really understand the, how, to, how to know what gear to put in the flywheel to make things work for you. One of those things that's super critical in the process is determining your ROI, aka return on investment, of your BDC. Now, when I say BDC in any of these slides, just know, guys, I'm talking about Business Development Center. I'm, talk, I'm speaking generally with regards to follow-up. So later on, you'll hear me mention that you can have, um, like if you look at bullet point number one, whether you do it in-house or outsourced, BDC, even though technically the term refers to an outsource, BDC in, in this case of what we're seeing today is, is referred to as just your follow-up in general. So just keep that in mind. So with regards to figuring out uh, your return on investment, right? You're gonna have to uh, look at a few different uh, things to understand uh, where you're at. Number one, are you gonna do it with somebody in house, somebody that's hired full time? Um, and there's a whole laundry list of, of, uh, of things that actually um, could help you identify. We've got some material that may be able to help you identify what's a good fit for you if, if doing it in-house or being outsourced. And so um, just hit me up on the chat. Let, let me know that you're interested and I can uh, send this over to you. Um, how many leads are you generating? That matters because number one, if you're doing it in-house, you need to know the capacity of the one particular uh, internet leads manager. And if you're outsourcing it, vast majority of you know, follow-up companies are going to charge you based on you know the tier of leads that you're you're having coming in. You need to have a good handle on like the software you're using, the training and the configuration, uh, taking into account uh, learning curves, how long it's going to take your staff to get up and running, and then of course you need to know what the cost of generating your leads are, right? So what is the cost of a bad BDC strategy? And that's really truly important. Because, <clears throat> you know, this is where kind of things start to fall apart, all right? Um, you look at the vast majority of traffic that goes on websites. You may think that part of follow-up uh, doesn't really involve the optimization that's on your site. Um, if, 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 you know, that may be, that, that's not the case. The, the tr truth of the matter is that it's all part of the process in being able to actually close and finalize a sale, right? Um, it, when you start thinking about the interaction, the customer's journey looks vastly different today than it did along, you know, even just a few years ago. Uh, I, I believe, I forget the exact stat, but I believe it's close to 80% of the sales process starts happening online before, you know, the customer even reaches out to you. So thinking about all of those things and that process every step of the way is critical. Lead forms is one of them. And what we end up seeing is that a lot of times you have people lying on your website and then 90% of that traffic goes away. Um, and then you have uh, you know, an enormous percentage of, of people that will essentially convert. But then because of the actual follow-up process where now you have the information to contact them, you know, there are other aspects like how many times you communicate, what was the experience like when you were communicating? Did you reach out enough times? Joe M was talking about with regards to like just one email, it's just courtesy. It's absolutely correct. You need at least 15 touch points, okay? And that is something that I'm gonna get into the stat and you're gonna be uh, blown away by what the average salesperson thinks that as far as like their outreach is and how much um, shorter they're missing out on. So it, it's essentially, 
ton of missed sales, ton of missed revenue opportunity, right? Believe it or not. So let's get further into the details as to why these things happen and how to choose that right gear so we can turn things and make it loose and, and, and get freed up. 78% of dealers that will, um, will lose a customer when they take longer than 60 seconds to get back to them. And it's an, it's an insane, insane um, stat. And here's the reason why. I mean, it's easy to see. You look at the numbers. If you're at like, you know, 24 hours, which is all the way to the cold side of the graph, uh, you know, you might as well just kind of almost like forget it. Like, it's like the lead was just kind of almost thrown away. And I'm actually not shocked when I actually came, come across a lot of dealers that are kind of getting back to some people 48 hours later. Think about it, you know, if particularly if it's a, if, you know, some of like you may be joining here and your dealer is closed on Sunday and Monday, let's just say, well, uh, you know, from the time that like, let's say, let's say that lead came in just right after closing on Saturday, then now your internet manager may not get back to this lead till Tuesday morning. That's well over 48 hours. So <clears throat> I'm going to go into details in a few slides as to what you can do to stay within that one minute range, right? Because I know that it's just kind of crazy things like, how do I do it so fast? And it's one of the, the, the worries, the concerns that I hear a lot from people. Um, here's put in a different way. More than 50% of sales will actually go to a dealership that responds first. And that's like an enormous part of the value of where your, your follow-up being on point is so important. Here's what we like to kind of call the OEM secret KPIs. And these are things that KPIs, another is, you know, acronym for key performance indicators. They're things that we're going to measure, but things that we're going to measure, they're going to tell us really if we're picking that right gear to put in place to make things kind of free up loose. So we're going to want to look at response times, how many times we're reaching out to people, which is what we call touch rates. How many times are you able to connect with them, your appointment ratios, and then missed appointments, right? And then now you've started to get a good handle on what you're generating from your marketing to what's actually sticking and then to actually bringing them onto the showroom. Then that's like where kind of, you know, we're kind of like beyond creative and dealerly pro stop. And that's kind of like where, you know, dojo starts, you know, uh, then it's the more human um, intervention. And I'm sure there's parts of it too, that Joe can speak to as far as like, um, the sales component of it when, when they're on the phone, which if you want to jump in and say something during that time, Joe, you're more than welcome to. I'm just going to grab a quick sip before we go to the next slide. Yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm happy to, you know, there's, there's, a, I have another program that's called army of one sales training. And one of the modules in there is called give good phone. And it was hysterical because I was actually at my sister's place years ago and um, she came out of her home office and she said, man, that guy gives good phone. And I just burst out laughing. <laughs> but like, but that's the truth though. When somebody does give good phone, what's the outcome of a phone call? It should be the same type of interaction. Like here's what, where, where dealerships get it wrong. Customer calls, right? You answer the phone, right? It, it, you know, ABC Power Sports, Right. And you might not even have the right way to answer, but that, uh, most people just say the name and, you know, how, you know, this is Joe speaking classic. Anyways, I'm not going to get into that. And then, then somebody says, yeah. Um, so uh, what do your products start at? And then what you mo most salespeople do, they tell them the price. And then it's like, okay. thank you. Click. Like what, the, what are you doing? Yeah. Like you got it. Listen, they've called <laughs> you because they're, they've raised their hand and they're interested in what you have to offer. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't answer their question, but think of the SOS, right? Think of what do I need to do to be able to find out some metrics? Like you should be, okay, they just called. Well, now measure the call, right? How many calls just came in? And then go, okay, so, hey, is this your first time calling our dealership? Have you been in before? Oh, you haven't? Hey, let's just, listen, we could discuss this over the phone till we're blue in the face until you touch and feel like we want you to be able to make an informed decision. What's a good time for you? I've, I've got availability on the weekend. Are you available Friday or Saturday? Like what, what's good? What's better for you Friday or Saturday? And set up the damn appointment. Like, geez. Anyway. Yeah. And I'm, one of the, the getting I'm all fired up. <laughs> there you go. I'm, it makes me feel good. I'm not the only one, you know, that that's like fired up about that. Cause some of the things that I have heard on calls is, uh, you know, 
Uh, now I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I've, I'm starting, I have kids now that my oldest just reached, you know, teenage years. And so, uh, you know, I'm still relatively young. I'll, I'll divulge my age. I'm about to be 36 and I've got a 13 year old, but I'm starting to be called cringy. So I don't know if some of you parents out here, you know, have heard that term, but cringy, you're cringy, dad. Apparently it's just an embarrassment stage. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty cringy, it seems. Um, I've, been, but, I've been cringy for 20 years, man. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why I bring that up is because, man, oh, man, in, in listening to call recordings, I have heard some cringy things and I kind of feel like telling my kids, you guys don't really know the first thing about cringy. Okay. Uh, sure. I got dad jokes, but cringy, cringy are the things we hear on sales calls. And one of them, which, you know, and I won't get too much into the aspect of the training because that's, that's not so much my cup of tea, but it's how do some of the sales guys even let people off the phone without even taking an email, you know, or, or a name. I have heard some kind of things that are just mind boggling, like, oh, we don't have it, but so-and-so across the street does, you know, <laughs> it's just, uh, there's still a way you can help. And I think, you know, Joe would agree. There's still a way that you can help somebody just because you're going to offer an alternative doesn't mean that you don't have their best interest at heart, you know, because um, I know that some of the objections that the sales guys would tell you right away is, well, I don't want to force them to something they don't want, you know? So I feel like that, goes to speaks to like a lot of the misconceptions that there are within the sales slash follow-up world reps make like literally 75% fewer attempts that they actually think they do. And there are so many uh, more things, more touch points and communication that needs to happen that is just not being done that it, it speaks to really the, uh, the heart of where a lot of the money is just withering away. Uh, you know, in the power sports industry, I think we have the tendency to not really see like, okay, you know, are they coming in? Because like vast majority, 99.999% of dealers, they have to sell a motorcycle at the store. So if so-and-so not coming in, then it's almost like they're not a real lead. False, you know, just because you can't see it and you can't touch it, doesn't mean that that person is not actively looking, shopping, um, and the question is, are you going to be there? Are you going to meet them where they're at? And are you going to, you know, part of that, a lot of what Joe, you talked about earlier and empathy and trying to come from a place of understanding, same thing goes for technology. I talk about meeting people where they're at all the time. We need to get so much better at that in the industry and meeting them where they're at also means, you know, I know a lot of dealers that it's smile and dial. Phone, 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 phone. <laughs> but it doesn't always work like that. And we actually have metrics that we've seen that there are some stores that are much phone heavier and you know, others that are much email follow-up heavier. And guess which one performs better? It, it's, it's a wonder, right? So what the ones that perform better do, it's not necessarily that they're stronger on email or stronger on text. Or they're just better well diversified in their follow-up uh if you look at the screen you know and, and and i know you know at this point you're probably like oh my gosh i gotta be well diversified in all the different follow-up attempts i gotta have how many calls attempts i gotta answer within 60 seconds right it's like a lot but don't worry because we're gonna go into a solutions part that's gonna actually show you here's how you implement those things to make it a lot easier for you because if you look at what's on your screen right now i mean literally you don't get above the 90s percent so these are phone calls, folks, by the way. So this is like, like, you know, number of phone calls. That's not even including, you know, email, text message, Facebook Messenger, et cetera. I mean, most reps, they actually give up on, after, you know, contacting somebody after just 1.3 attempts. So I know by this point, you're like, okay, you know, how many of these things are going to keep throwing at me, right? Uh, but I promise we're making our way to the, uh, to the solution part of the presentation. Um, but let's talk about being able to identify some of those things that I kind of lightly talked about them a, a few slides ago. What are some of those things where you're like, hmm, yeah, if, this, if, if, if I'm experiencing this, I probably have a follow-up, either, either a follow-up strategy issue 
or maybe, you know, a marketing and sales flywheel issue going on. I'm going to tell you about some of those things are actually quite simply, simpler in a way that you would, you know, that you would expect. Um, are you having to overspend on expensive software? Are you having to have 10 different dashboards to control and manage things? And that some of them may feel super complicated. Um, that's one of them. That's not the way, you know, if you're looking at the person at the slide, it shouldn't look like this. Um, that's what you don't want. Okay. Uh, another thing that you may be experiencing is that leads look seemingly low quality. So I say seemingly, seemingly is an important keyword, right? So just keep that in mind because um, if, if, if that agency that kept telling you, these are good quality leads, they just need to, uh, you know, if it sounded like an excuse, it, it isn't. And now I'm going to start talking about the solutions of how it is that that can be solved because I feel like in part why the power sports industry in such great need is because people will say like your OEM may be going to you and saying, hey, man, your follow up time sucks. You're not following up enough, you know, and you're like, yeah, OK, man. And how do I fix it? <laughs> so, I mean, I hear that from a ton of dealers. That may be something that you're experiencing where you're like, I'm sick and tired of my OEMs telling me that I don't follow up enough or I don't follow up quickly enough. Where's the solution, right? So seemingly low quality leads. Here's another big one, which is struggling with booked appointment ratios and no-shows. That's a big one, right? And then you may also feel like a lot of these, uh, and this one's the one that kind of leads to feeling like they're bad quality, right? But it may just seem like some of these guys just ghost you all together or maybe just kind of give you enough and then they just disappear. Another one is that your sales staff may be uh, complaining about feeling overwhelmed like, really, do you expect me to pick up the phone um, while also, you know, be helping out another customer and showing them the, the new unit or, or, or taking them to financing, whatever the case may be, right? So put anything in the chat if, you know, if you struggled with any of these things in the past or, or, or these are things that, or any questions, by the way, and or comments, and I'm going to slide on over to actually making it more solution focused. I'm going to go into the three main success BDC uh, success follow-up strategies for dealers. All right. So let's go straight into the first one, right? It's simple. Outreach cadence. What the heck is outreach cadence? Well, outreach is, you know, you reaching out. So essentially, you know, somebody contacted your dealer, they said they were interested in a unit. So to that point, and that's like when, I, when I, that's the point where I asked the question, remember it earlier in my first few slides, I said, um, the marketing work, did it matter? Okay, that's that pivotal point right there, where the outreach cadence yeah. begins. Um, because at this point, everything you do from second zero, I don't know if it's second zero or second or second one, that that came in makes an enormous difference on how you are bringing somebody in from what's seemingly the digital unseen world and how you're gonna be able to start a, a, an, an invisible relationship with them through digital and actually eventually compel them because that's really how they, they should be compelled. And it should be, uh, you know, I love that Joe used a term, something about uh, inspiring, I think it's a term that, that he used with regards to inspiring people. So they should feel inspired and they should feel compelled to go to your dealership. Now, you may be uh, secret shopped or audited by like Pipe Piper and you'll see that some of the stuff that they put in there, it's just very like much a checklist and that's great. And they'll say things where like, what's, you know, what are you including in your emails that add value? The problem with just going off of those things is that sometimes you know, you, you just start worrying about how much you cram into the one email and then it just becomes subhuman. Your main thing is just to be human about it. And I think that's probably a theme that you're going to hear throughout all of our presentations today. I know, um, shoot, Joe hit on it. Stacy hit on it. I'm hitting on it now. And I feel like even, um, that even, uh, you know, Laura is going to go into it, uh, in a second. So, Everything from that point on makes an enormous difference. The cadence 
of what your outreach will. So what should that look like, right? Well, the very first thing is going to be that you want to try to maximize the different avenues that you're going to reach this person through. And that's a su super critical component of it because if you still stay singularly focused and this, I cannot stress this enough. I, I really, really, really cannot stress this enough, which is um, that if you just focus on what you or your team is most comfortable isolating the bunch of other type of opportunities to be able to communicate with that lead. Why is that important? Why does that matter? Because remember, you're empathizing. You, you, you know, you you want to be able to have an engagement with them, right? And what's happening now is here, you know, I don't know if you guys can see my camera, but I know you're looking at my screen, but I'm sharing. But if you can see me, here's my phone. We've literally got our phones on us all the time. And literally in, on that phone, we've got like, the, you know, little, we're like mini gods with just the palm of our hands. We got options. I mean, talk about Google My Business and being able, you know, to, to rate businesses by their reviews and so many other things. So who do you think is going to win in the digital landscape when somebody's up against, you know, you and two other neighboring dealers? They're going to, the, the, the buyer's process begins prior and they're going to be checking out your reputation. They're going to be checking out what their experience was like navigating and trying to contact you on your website. And then here now with regards to the follow-up process is where the magic begins as far as, are you going to engage them at a, at a mat, at a, in a manner that matters, right? So the cadence coming back to that is going to be trying to reach them as, in, with as many avenues at first, and then you kind of start staggering them. So as an example, if it's during business hours, the lead comes in, Try sending them a text, try e do the, the default autoresponder email, which should always, you know, um, go out, whether it is during or outside of business hours. You can even do one where you can time it 15 or 20 minutes later. So it's not obvious, you know, that it is an autoresponder email. Those are all things that play into the cadence. Um, just as well as the actual message that you're including in there needs to be extremely well crafted. It needs to be able to reflect the, the culture in your leadership and the, sorry, the culture in your dealership. Um, and those are things that are very important. And I think that, you know, for those of you that are here and that, you know, you listen to Joe's um, presentation and a lot of the concepts that he's talking about connecting with people think that way when writing these, when writing and crafting these messages and thinking about that cadence. So, you know, when you start out with kind of casting a white net at first, when the lead first comes in, because that part of it is so crucial. But then for the follow up, you want to stagger things. Don't send them a, a ringless voicemail and a, and a call and a text and a Facebook messenger message and, a, and, 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 you know, and an email all at once. So you could now on the next day do a light email. The next day after that, you can follow up with, you know, uh, a text. And then maybe the next day after that, you could do a ringless voicemail drop. Um, so that cadence of it and then nurturing, that's part of the nurturing process. People may, it may feel like they're completely ghosting you. But it's important to think that we don't really know what's happening in their world and how preoccupied they are. And very likely the reason why they didn't answer to the first like two or three, four messages was just because they were so inundated with different things. So being there and like really, truly like doing your absolute best to really reach out and help that person so that they can, you know, uh, enjoy the vehicle of their choice, you know, and, and help them have a life altering decision for the better. I feel like it's your responsibility to do the absolute most you can and your cadence and how many things you put into the actual follow-up are critical components of it. So that kind of brings me over to number two, right? Which is outreach automation. So I promised you that I would talk to you about how to put things together with the difficulty of having to have so many different platforms, having to do so many outreach and have to do it so quickly. But the good news is that you have choices, you have options of technology out there and reliable technology that you can leverage um, to your advantage so that you centralize things. 
So the first one that comes to mind is trying to trying to put everything together in a dashboard that makes things easier for you. And then of course, being able to have a reliable integration so that let's say all of your leads coming in from your website, but also very important leads that you may have coming in from Trader, um, leads that you may have coming in from uh, the chat function on your site, Facebook Messenger, uh, all get put into one place. And then that one place follows the rules that we're kind of talking about with regards to the automation. So there are just endless different software technologies out there that you can use. You have to make sure that you're using one that's simple and that really just jives with, you know, the way that your dealer operates. Um, and that's something really important to keep in mind. Does this platform, is this platform really going to work for us? And then you kind of really, you know, get likely married to, to that software so that it helps you. Also be on the lookout for like softwares that are going to give you a difficulty um, having your data exported after if you want to leave them or that, you know, kind of box you in. So that's something very important uh, to keep in mind. So you heard me talk about having a lot of avenues and a lot of different options on how to, how to communicate to people. So why is automation and why is putting in as many communication channels as possible? Because the more of them that you use increases success rate of being able to reach somebody by 161%. That's enormous. Now, here's some of the, I would just say, basic ones for success that we implement. There are more, um, you know, but these are like your fundamental ones. You want to have an automatic uh, <clears throat> call generated to your dealer if it's during business hours so that now essentially your team gets a call and it says, hey, Joe Motorsports, this is, you know, you have a lead on line one. Their name is Christy. Press one and be connected. And what the system does essentially when they hit, you know, one with, with these softwares, it'll dial the lead's phone number and then it attempts to make that connection. There's also the option that if the person didn't answer, you can hang up safe, safely and then, you know, they get a ringless voicemail. Um, throughout the lifespan, what we call the sequence of following up for one particular lead, let's just say about a two week time span, you should also drop, think about dropping two ringless voicemails. The way ringless voicemails uh, work is essentially that um, it literally will ring the phone for a split second and then it just goes straight to voicemail and it drops the pre-recorded you know, message. You wanna include text messages and you wanna include emails as well. If a lead came through Facebook Messenger, you wanna be able to reach out to them. And just as a heads up, because a lot of people don't know this and Facebook constantly is changing all of their policies and all, um, there's a limit and it, don't quote me, but I believe it's 48 because they just recently changed it to when the lead follows, when the lead comes in, if you wait more than 48 hours to follow up to that lead, you cannot now follow up via Facebook Messenger unless that lead regenerates. And it's just Facebook's excellent way to make sure that they are milking you for the money that you're spending with them on their platform. So just keep that in mind though, because if you're, if, you know, as an example that I gave to some of the dealerships that close Sunday and Monday, and you had a Facebook lead come in on Messenger, this is for, um, for paid, by the way. Um, and that lead came in and then, and then, you know, your follow-up guy or gal is not going to follow up till Tuesday morning. You can't even message that person yet. So with a lot of the things that I've told you, the number three aspect, super critical, is essentially to have a really good grasp on where you're at as far as your spending, as far as where your efforts are taking you, what you're closing, how many people are actually making appointments, the whole nine. So that's where reporting is super critical. Get down to the nitty gritty of finding out, okay, so how many leads did I generate? Um, what was my cost per lead? How many of those leads actually turn into an appointment? And how many of those actually turn into a sale? You want to be able to get a grasp so that you can track what we talked about earlier on, which was your ROI, also known as your return on investment. You want to look at things such as your follow-up campaigns, your reply rates, how much people are opening them. Reply rates are super, super critically important. Okay. And so that's 
that wraps it up for number three. Before I give you a recap, I want to open it up to any of our panelists that want to add any comments to anything that I just reviewed, or even to anybody on the chat to leave some comments or do some questions. I'll do a, a, a full-on Q&A uh, toward the end, but I'll open it up real quick so I can get a, a drink, any comments or anything like that you guys want to share. Hey, Joe, I've got something that stepped off right at the beginning of your presentation, and, I, and I've just been, it's been on the tip of my tongue the whole time. Um, you had talked about people running an internal program versus outsourcing the program. Yeah. And, you know, this is going to sound salesy. I'm going to try and say this in a way that makes sense. But I, only once did I really see an internal program that like blew me away and knocked my socks off. And that was yeah. in the marine uh, industry, uh, a company called Marine Max. Um, when I worked for Suzuki, I went to Marine Max and did some training down there. And dude, they had like 12 people in their marketing department and BDC. And, and I mean, just like, it looked like gaming computers everywhere, right? Everybody had multiple screens and was just going after it. Um, but usually what I see is a dealer will put like one person in charge of, hey, track this, track that, follow these 19 channels. And then it just never seems to, never seems to happen or progress. And I was wondering if you had some insight on that or, or what makes it fail, what makes it work? That's a, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I have seen very similar things, which is essentially that um, I see outside programs work better. And I know that a lot of, a lot of dealers will kind of say, you know, it, I've tried different ones. And, and that is one of the aspects that suck about, you know, like trying to do it outsourced, right? Like really finding out which ones are going to be, which ones are going to, it's not necessarily that uniformly, you could just say, it's not as binary as saying these people suck or they're good. <laughs> Very oftentimes is, are they a good fit for your dealership? Is that yeah. agency a good fit for your dealership? So sometimes, you know, you'll hear dealers that will say, I got a I've tried, I've tried an agency or two for, you know, to do my follow-up or, and same thing goes by the way for marketing, right? We hear that often, like, oh man, that agency suck. And it's just the question is, are, you know, I think that the problem traced back to perhaps not being a good fit for each other um, and in the, the way they work. But in general, that aside, I do see that outsourced works better. And in my belief, I think it's, it's because to do this right, depending on the number of leads that you have, this needs to be a culture change in the organization. So yeah. as an example, you know, it's same thing that with, you know, what my twin Joe does, you know, he will come in and I don't want to, I don't want to speak too much for him because I, I, I don't want to misrepresent, but he essentially helps in training, uh, you know, and that training builds that culture. It's a mind, mindset, a uh, mindset shift that helps establish that culture within the dealership. So, so you know, it, it's things that, that you learn that if you put in place will make you be successful. The reason why in particularly with, with BDC, in-house versus outsourced, I see that most dealers don't have a successful program to your point is because I think a lot of dealers are not necessarily there. Like they're, they're, they're probably more, closer to saying, yes, I need a program that teaches about sales and that gets my sales staff, you know, trained properly and ramped up and all of that. And like, I think they more readily accept that than saying, oh, I need a program, you know, and I need to build something from the inside that's complex in and of itself, because the follow-up process in and of itself, whether you have every single one of your salespeople follow up or you have a, a, a dedicated BDC manager, that component of it in and of itself needs attention. So, you know, it, 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 it's like, it's almost like you're forming a, a, you know, an organism within the organism. It doesn't matter yeah. what it looks like. It's just that it needs that. It's like a plant. Like it's like, a, think about it as a garden. Your dealership is a garden. That one plant is, an, is, 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 you know, a plant in the entire garden of the dealership and you have to water it. You've got it. So a lot of them are like, well, yeah, we'll just reply to emails and we're good. Mm. Yeah, not, re not well, really, you know, in, in the chat, Steve Jones put up a couple of comments. Um, a, he asked if we had an example to show how things get automated and you've got a good, you know, 10 minutes or so to go into that. So I, I didn't want to take away from more of your presentation time. But then he also noted that a lot of in-house things, um, he says they give up 
like a lot of dealers will, will fail because they give up within a few weeks or months. And I've seen that happen too. I'll talk to some business owners and say, hey, this is a 30, 60, 90 day program where we're going to evaluate every 30 days and constantly make changes. And then, you know, at 180, we'll really cement things in. And maybe they just don't put enough time and effort into it or, or they get impatient. Yeah, I think, um, I think that uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's, a mix, it's a mix of things. Life gets busy. Um, you know, they think because of one of the aspects that I mentioned earlier with regards to feeling like you're being seemingly ghosted, I would say that like, it's very easy to immediately be like, oh, this is not working. You know what I mean? Like, like this is, this is just not happening and, and, and nobody's actually on the other end and this is not going to make any, you know, any difference. Um, so that the automation component of it, right. Is a big help for that. Uh, because it, it stays there and it, and it does the relentless work. It does the very time consuming work, the relentless work and it's never set it and forget it uh, because at the end of the day, I do want people to understand that like, you know, once somebody raises their hand, they need to step in. They need to step in and, and be like, okay, let's, let's now do something with it. We actually offer, you know, managed services for dealers so that where we can either do like a soft complete BDC solution or, or a soft BDC solution or a full uh, BDC solution where they're, where our team's actually like dialing out. The soft one is more on, along the lines of like, hey, somebody replied via email or text. And then now you carry on the conversation in the manner that that person wants, right? Because you know if they replied via text. So I think, and I don't know if I, if I went off too much on the, on the weeds there and I didn't end up answering your question, um, but it's gonna, it, it, I think that they give up prematurely because it's time consuming, because they don't know that it's actually making a difference, you know? And they go on to other things and they forget about it, you know? Hey, Joe, you know what? I, I'm, I want to speak to something here that I think a lot of salespeople and just people in general have a fear. And they have this, this fear of having these automations go out and that people are going to not like it, that they're going to receive too many emails or they're going to receive too many texts. And I, like, here's the reality, okay? If you, if you get an email that you don't like, you can unsubscribe. If you get a text that you don't like, you could just write stop. And that's it. Like, you can turn this stuff off. And I think that as a society, we have to remember that, you know, and I'm, I'm cheering you on, Joe, because th the three things that we as leaders need to do as business people and my coaches remind me this all the time, right? Joe, is there something that you're doing right now that is a waste of your, you know, $5,000 an hour greatness? Because everybody here right now, every one of you, if you're on right now, you're watching this, you should really be thinking that, hey, I make 5,000 bucks an hour. That is my rate. So am I doing a $20 an hour job? Because if you are, you either automate, delegate, or eliminate. Yeah. Because like, if you're all 5,000 bucks an hour. So if you're out mowing your lawn, right? Like you could give somebody 25 bucks to mow the lawn so you can go out and make your the difference of 4,975 bucks. Now, if somebody says to me, yeah, you know what? But I really love to mow my lawn. I'd look at them and I go, do you mow your neighbor's lawn? <laughs> <laughs> and they go, well, it's like, yeah. So you don't love it that much. So like <laughs> put it into perspective. You need to automate, delegate, or eliminate. So follow up. Listen, I could write a book that's that's called "Your Follow Up Sucks." Most salespeople they don't follow up, like they just suck at it. Okay, number one. Number two, if you can automate it and make it affordable, I'm telling you, like it's the way to do it. In the bicycle industry, that like. like create an automation. I've, I've, you know, in the bicycle industry, I've got partners that have done that. And Joe, you're, you're the guy in this ecosystem. You're the man. I've looked up what he's doing. Like, think of it. And then again, delegate it. Well, okay. Yeah. I, I can delegate my follow-up. Okay. Good luck with that. You're going to actually get somebody to do the follow-up for you because I can tell you following up is where the fortune is. And 
we're bombarded with so much stuff. So you got to be able to break through the static. Yeah. And that's what yeah. you're able to do. And so, Without and, then, a doubt. and then, then there's a thing that, you know, before I, I cut off here is it, you said relentless and it's just so, so good because you need to be relentless without being a pest. There's a difference. Yes. Yeah, and exactly. so then it's a question of time management. So what does a relentless follow-up system look like? And I, I, I teach this. And again, if you want to manually do it, you should be doing at least a minimum of four touch points a day for four days. So there's 16 touch points that you manually do. Good luck to try to just do that when you've got new people coming in and your phone's ringing and, oh yeah, I've got to get the kids to soccer and all. you're just not going to do it, which is yeah. why your follow-up sucks. So if you can automate it, let Joe, my twin, let him, let, he's got you. He's got you. He'll take care of you. <laughs> and you know, another thing too, that I have realized, Joe, is that, that it's, it's an, it's, I think it's almost like an excuse. I think that may stem from fear with regards to, oh, they're going to think I'm a pest, this and that. At the higher level, <clears> if, if, when it comes to uh, marketing in general, if you're not pissing off a few people, you're not doing it right. I totally agree. Because, Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yep. You know, I, I get every now and then I'll get somebody who actually takes time out of their day to send me an email and say, oh, I can't mind. It's, it's just like, OK, you know, the idea isn't to be a pest. And that's why cadence, which I talked about earlier, comes into play and in mapping things out. But I couldn't be more on board with regards to what you're saying with, with regards to the automation. If things are set up properly from the beginning, there is an aspect of it that it's just going to be done for you. Why do you want to really just sit there and truly do just a, you know, 10, 15, $20 an hour of just like following up with emails? It makes no sense. It, it, it makes absolutely no sense. And the truth of the matter is that this ties back to what you do and how you help people change their mindset to be able to really truly connect with other humans. Cause that's what sales is about. Yep. When we take away the, the, the busy work of all these emails and da, 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 then now it leaves more time for that. The real stuff. The stuff that people really, truly enjoy. It's funny because technology has driven us apart in a sense and it's, you know, kind of put a wedge in between us. But at the end of the day, what's really ironic about it is that people still seek that very human connection one way or another. 100%. And yeah. So, so I, I don't know if you guys could see here on the screen, I changed, and this is like the back end of Dealerly Pro. Do you guys see that? Hold on. I'm not seeing yes. thump. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. Yep. I wasn't seeing. Perfect. So this is to answer Steve's question, a little bit of an example. And we've got tons of different things here, right? Where we can go, um, you know, and add a new event as an example. And then, you know, we can do messenger. If it originated there, we could do SMS, email, uh, voicemail. Um, you could even run web hooks. So if you wanted to connect to, you know, to, to an outside platform, but this is kind of more of like your average standard one as far as automation. And it essentially says that if it's, you know, within business hours, so you could edit that in here, then you want this to be sent in such and such, uh, you know, uh, that you want this, this call to happen. Um, same thing with, with text. So we leave text for it to only happen during business hours. Um, and so this is some of that perfect example of how to automate it. Once it's set in here, Tons of parameters can be edited. So as an example, if you have a round robin, you know, for your sales staff, the email signature could be automatically inputted, uh, input into the, the outgoing email. And so whatever um, uh, sales associate it gets assigned to the lead, it'll actually inject their email signature. And, and you can, you know, you can, you can see on here, there's like a particular cadence of certain amount of days after the first one that you follow up. And by the way, it doesn't really just end two weeks after the initial lead coming in because those people afterward, unless there was like a resounding no, and that's when you change things and you get to remove people, um, you know, you want to put them into a longer term sort of follow-up nourishing kind of sequence where like by default, every lead that that's coming in, you know, you should be putting into a MailChimp or a, a um, what do you call it? a uh, uh, constant contact list that, That's you know, at the, at the bare minimum, you know, you're, you're sending them a newsletter for your, for your new stuff once a month, as an example. Did you guys have a comment on there? 
Yeah, actually, there's a couple, and I want to I don't want to give people their shout outs because we've got people listening on other channels. Um, Steve Jones writes, he puts, as an industry, we are extremely poor at following up. Having an automated response for an inquiry within minutes instead of days leads to increased sales opportunities. Multiply the opportunities by how many contacts you lost because no one followed up. And man, that really mirrors, uh, that mirrors my own personal experience. I put in the comments myself earlier, I was scared to death to automate things because I thought it would interfere with the relationship. But as you pointed out, Joe, when, when you have automation to pick up some of the pieces that are mundane, you actually get to focus your relationship energy rather than spend it on auto replies and stuff. Because half of the stuff That's you would exactly copy and right. paste anyway, what sense is that? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and there are certain very few parameters that you, that you can just put in there through custom fields and things so that you're making sure that things are properly set up. And that, that, that's all front loading stuff. Once that's in place, you're good, you know? Um, yeah. And then the, the rest, you just, it, it has to be written in a way that's very human. So people are afraid of the automation when the automation isn't the problem, it's more than anything, the messaging, you know? So um, let me just kind of recap, because I want to see if there may be some question. I don't know, I, may, I, I don't want to go over time, but I want to do give a little bit of time for a Q and A if we do have it afterward. Um, but I want to just kind of recap that like, as a dealer, you're going to want something that's, that's simple, fast, budget conscious, and relatively simple to, to integrate, right. And train your employees on. And that actually allows you to be able to scale, uh, once you put the system in place and that it addresses, obviously the three main profitable components of follow-up that we spoke about. So you do this by implementing a, a quality lead generating system that cherry picks prospects for you. So we kind of talked about that goes back to um, the BDC uh, topic that uh, Kurt, you and I just mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, so it, it goes back to that aspect of it, whether you're going to do it in-house or not, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that you're, you're putting in a system that you're, that you're watering that plant. That's what's going to be really important. And you want to do it to a way that suits your dealership's needs and your dealership style. So don't necessarily just go by, oh, you know, so-and-so is doing it like this. It's got to make sure it works for, for your crew. And focus on the low-hanging fruit, uh, you know, when it comes to marketing, because um, <clears throat> those are going to give you the highest return on investment with like, you know, the least amount of work involved. So you do that, you're going to dominate, uh, you know, your competition without a doubt. I mean, there's just so many people that aren't doing the right things that don't be afraid if you start I mean, literally like don't feel like, oh, you're going to fall on your face and do it because right now there's just so many people that aren't doing anything that just doing something will put you ahead of the game by a lot. So it's really, really critical. Once you create and put this system in place, it's just up to you how much you want to grow. Now, if any of you that are here with me right now um, want to talk and chat about implementing this, Either, you know, put something on the chat that says, I'm interested, hit me up or whatever the case may be. Or you could go to gobeyondcreative.com slash schedule and you'll see my calendar that's available on there. And my email's also up on the screen. And with that, I want to go ahead and open it up for Q&A. Do we have, I think I, think I might have just hit time, Kurt. Do we have enough time for a, a, Q &A, a quick Q&A? No, go ahead and uh, end your screen share and open up the Q&A screen for folks and, and let's see what we've got. Uh, I don't see any questions that are queued yet. Uh, we did have a few comments. If you want to take a look at the comment screen, um, you, if you can keep your that, screen, if you can keep your screen shared, but go back, Joe, to that uh, to that slide with that time and uh, effectiveness back toward the beginning of your sure I don't is uh, what it was called exactly. I'm I'm thinking is it is it the one with regards to like the number of touch the follow up touches and. Well, it had to do with the time. It was uh, obviously could it be showcasing this the faster. Yes. <laughs> so lead response time, you know, I think this sums up a lot of what you're talking about and why the services you provide or the concept that dealers should wrap their head around this sort of uh, process and, and automation and, and things like what you do to me yeah. is, is this is the apparent piece. It's, a, it's obvious and so true. These are conversations I have with dealerships all the time. 
Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I get, you know, it, it's on the, it's on the board as a lead, but you know, we didn't close it. Well, where did you get with it? Well, we, you know, by the time we got with them, we couldn't get with them. We emailed them. They never came back. We returned their call. You name it. Yeah. But the yeah, conversation exactly. a lot of times comes back to this. And this is where I, a lot of times urge people to consider services like your own. If they can't do this in a timely fashion, they're just wasting their time, obviously. You know. Yeah. Exactly. I, I agree. And I just want to confirm because I didn't I I'm on a separate screen. That was Brian, right? <laughs> yeah, that's Brian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. cool. Sorry. So you know, no, no, it's all good. Uh Brian, one thing that that um it, this is this is actually fascinating because um you know you're you're uh, am I allowed to say you're a trader guy? Yeah. That, I don't know if that's if, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't trader. know if that's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> not that yeah. yeah yeah exactly okay i just didn't know if we i wanted to respect uh you know branding guidelines so <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to throw you under the bus um yeah that's so that's who that's who keeps my mortgage paid so yeah i can't complain there exactly so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do that to you but um the reason why i bring it up is because you have a high level of exposure of talking to a vast number of dealers that um essentially are in this pickle right with regards to follow-up time and all of those things that you just mentioned were like, oh, we got busy and blah, 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 blah. One component that I mentioned with regards to unifying, but I don't think that I uh, focused or made enough emphasis on that's super critical, whether you do it through somebody like us or you do it through somebody else separately, is for the dealership to try their best, whatever it is, if they're using VIN solutions or if they're using e-leads or if they're using, you know, um, I don't know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, DX1, you know, the, the DX1 D, uh, dealer management system, whatever, to try to put um, all of the leads into one platform. Because one of the things like on that screen that I shared with you guys, where it actually showed you the sequence of the automations in the previous screen prior to that, which I don't think I showed, you see that we have it all broken down by where the lead is coming in. And that's an important factor, folks, because the way you talk to a Facebook lead is going to be different than the way you talk to a Google lead. You may ask why. Well, because if you think about it, it's, it's essentially based on the nature of the platforms that you're doing your marketing on. What do I mean by that? Well, if I go to Google.com because I say motorcycle, you know, uh, motorcycle shop nearest me or I'm looking for a particular part and accessory, whatever the case may be. But if I'm putting in near me and those sort of terms, that's very high intent. That is somebody who's likely very ready to pull the trigger on some sort of purchase. Could be, uh, you know, a $40 pair of gloves, uh, a $400 helmet, or I don't know, you know, $20,000, $25,000 unit. Sorry, vehicle. <laughs> Caught myself. I shouldn't be calling them units. So um, the point being is uh, essentially that you speak to these folks differently, right? That person that came in with a higher intent, your urgency needs to be different. The sequence for them is going to look a little bit different than the people you serve ads to or you interact with on Facebook. Why? Because Facebook is interest-based, meaning that they didn't actually put a search term on their browser and then you came up. You came up on their feed because you know that they either visited your website or you know that they're in an interest group such as motorcycles or riders or they like Yamahas or they like Indian, whatever the case may be, right? So the, the, the nature of the approach in the outreach, your cadence is different. Um, your, you know, the, how you're going to reach out is different. So does that kind of make sense or just convolute things uh, more? No, I think that that's important. Those are important nuances that people should have that conversation with the attribution, the tempo, you know, when you start interacting with somebody, those are all important pieces. And if, if a dealer doesn't quite know why those things are important, I think they should reach out directly to Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And then just kind of as a comment to kind of wrap this up for folks that are um, thinking they, they might hear this and go, ah, this is cool, but it's beyond our scope, or this is interesting, but we're not ready for that yet. Um, Mark Sheffield makes a nice comment. It's, I'm sure it was meant to be funny, but it's so on point. Um, it says, you only need to be bad to be better than most of your competition. There's like, the British humor. I love it. Yeah. 
if, 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 you don't, if you don't think you're good enough or if you're a perfectionist and you're waiting to have everything be just right, you're going to wait forever. It's never going to get done. So, you know, um, jump out, jump out on faith, take some steps, implement some processes, and then, you know, measure the matrix, take a look at it and go, did this work? Did this not work? And then tweak it as you go, you know? Yeah, I think you make a really good point. And I've actually um, been encouraged in the past. I've been given feedback to say like, on, you know, on, in, in the uh, previous webinars that I've hosted to um, express to our attendees that like, hey, you know, if you like, I would just encourage you book, like book a time for us to chat. Because what happens at that point is worst case scenario, you know, you, you will go out with some sort of actionable plan that'll be beneficial and that'll work for your dealership as far as like having been given free advice and free pointers and, and whatnot, you know, as opposed to uh, immediately saying in your mind, oh, th this may not be for me or it's too intensive or it may be too expensive, whatever the case may be, I would just say, just schedule. And, and literally it could be, you know, we could find out within five or 10 minutes that it may not be a good fit. Or it could lead into something where, you know, it, maybe we spent 20, 30 minutes on the phone and you walked away with an amazing amount of, of things, uh, or we may be able to work together. Whatever the case may be, there's, there's no pressure. And in reality here, what it is is about uplifting the industry. So I would just say schedule, you know, do yourself a favor and try to figure out, you know, whether this is a thing that you want to uh, pursue or not. Nice, nice. Um, Joe, I just want to throw it out to you. I know following up Joe Marcou takes, takes a little bit of a deep breath. You got to get ready to talk fast and, and fill in the gaps, but man, you knocked it out of the park the, the information you share, um, you and I spent some, some time on zoom and on the phone before, and, uh, man, I knew that you were going to bring it. I knew that you were going to have information that dealers could really implement and use. And man, thank you so much for participating in our round table today. It's, it's as a, as a founding power partner of this thing, man, you, you really brought it. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, Kurt. That means a lot to me. Thank you. And I really do hope that our attendees stay on because we have some really exciting stuff. I just want to say we've got yeah. um, and really, really cool things. Yeah. And, and for the attendees that are still keyed in, no matter where you're looking, I've been putting the live Zoom link all over the place with the passcode. So share it, bring friends. Um, we've got two more segments to go. We did not factor in a lunch time or a cold beer time for people. So depending on what time zone you're in, if you got to grab a sandwich or grab a cold beer, run and do it right now and be back in like 60 seconds uh, because Laura is bringing a lot of valuable information and some value added perspective to, you know, being in power sports and utilizing social media. And I know that that is a huge buzzword and uh, we've got someone that can really bring the heat with great experience. I think...